Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Nineteen sixty-four is the year that this book was published, Games People Play. Uh, in this book, which went on to become a huge bestseller, selling over five million copies, uh, the author, uh, a psychiatrist, made the point that uh, when people interact with uh, with family members, with friends, lovers, coworkers, or competitors, and even with strangers, they do so according to some rules, certain patterns, which uh, usually result in predictable outcomes. So this is what he referred to as as games that people play in their social relationships. And in this presentation, I'd like to convince you that there are at least three different disciplines uh, that can contribute to our understanding of human relationships. First, evolutionary biology. This is because people have, uh, in my view, biological predispositions to act in a certain way towards other people. And the genetic basis and the neural, physiological, emotional, and cognitive mechanisms that control social behavior and decision making might have evolved by natural selection over a period of a million years. Natural selection tend to produce behaviors that are advantageous to the individuals who show these behaviors. So these behaviors have benefits to individuals and tend to have low costs. Uh, another discipline that examines the benefits and the costs of behavior is behavioral economics. Behavioral economists use uh, rational models of behavior, uh, which assume that people behave in ways so as to increase the benefits and uh, reduce the costs. Uh, the only difference between evolutionary biologists and behavioral economists is that economists assume that, behavior, uh, that people behave rationally, that there's uh, uh, consciousness, there's rationality involved in behavior, whereas uh, uh, evolutionary biologists do not necessarily assume that our behavior is controlled exclusively by, by consciousness. Uh, and finally, the third discipline I think that can help us understand human relationship is uh, primatology, the study of behavior of uh, non-human primate species. And this is because the same evolutionary processes that shaped uh, human social behavior also shaped the behavior of other primate species, particularly those that are closely related to us. So these other primate species essentially play the same games in the social relationships as we do. So usually in every relationship there's a person who is uh, dominant and a relationship who is, and a person who is uh, subordinate, and typically these two people have different benefits and costs when they engage in this interaction. So this is a, a hypothetical email conversation between uh, a graduate student, we'll call her Jessica, and her advisor, we call Professor Smith. So Jessica begins this conversation by writing a long unsolicited email to Professor Smith in which she asks a lot of questions and requests some information. Professor Smith sees the email, Let's us sit in the inbox for a few hours, then sends a short reply uh, with all the answers to the questions. Within minutes, Jessica is encouraged by getting the response from her professor, so she sends an even longer email with more questions and more requests for information. This time, Professor Smith waits a little bit longer. He waits until the next day, and then replies with an even shorter messages. Then Jessica sends two more emails. Professor Smith replies later and later, and with increasingly short messages. After uh, Jessica's fifth email message, Professor Smith does not reply at all, <laughs> and that ends the conversation. Okay? If you look at how two primates, for example, two chimpanzees exchange grooming behavior, it happens exactly this way. So the grooming bow uh, is began by the subordinate individual who grooms the dominant for a very long time, then stops and waits for the other to reciprocate. The dominant waits a while, then reciprocates with a short bow. The subordinate grooms again for a long bow, then stops and waits. There's a, a longer delay in the reciprocation. The reciprocation is shorter and shorter. At some point, the dominant simply uh, stands up and walks away, and that ends that conversation. <laughs> the low-status individual has more to gain from this interaction. Okay? There's more benefits, whereas the high-status individual essentially has little to benefit, but investing a lot in this exchange has uh, higher costs, and that's why you see this imbalance. Okay? So we can make some sense of the way we exchange emails by uh, analyzing benefits and costs and also by looking at uh, relationships in other primate species. But let me tell you a little bit more about dominance, what it is. So let me uh, describe this hypothetical situation in which two well-known characters, uh, Yogi Bear and Boo Boo Bear, one day uh, meet in the middle of a forest and they see an apple. Uh, they're both hungry, they both want this apple. Uh, they can't both have it, they can't share it. So each bear then has two options. Uh, they can either threaten to fight with the other bear, so they can play the hawk, uh, uh, move in uh, game theory language to get the apple, 
or they can just uh, yield. They can let the other bear uh, have it. Essentially, they behave in submissive ways, so they can play the dog move. Uh, in this particular case, so the two bears each have a 50% chance of winning the contest if there is a fight. But so there's three possible situations, three possible outcomes. One in which they both play the hawk, they both threaten each other and uh, threaten to escalate the fight, or they both behave submissively and so they negotiate over who's going to get the apple, or one plays the hawk and the other one plays dove, in which case the hawk will get the apple and the other one doesn't. So the third situation in which one plays hawk and one plays dove is dominance. Okay? So dominance essentially is a, is a situation in which uh, a conflict of interest or a disagreement between uh, two individuals is resolved when one individual is dominant, ha acts aggressively, usually threatens the other one, and the other one submits. Dominance is, is, a, uh, is a, uh, an intrinsic characteristic of all human relationships. Uh, so there's dominance between parents and children, between siblings. Uh, uh, children establish dominance with their, with their peers as early as uh, two years of age on the playground. They fight over who's going to be dominant and who's going to be subordinate. Uh, I, I think that in many romantic couples, uh, there is dominance. Uh, in some cases, it's not as clear, but uh, uh, when couples are stable, usually it's because there is a clear difference in uh, <laughs> who makes the decision and who doesn't. And finally, uh, dominance is also uh, an important characteristic of relationships uh, in the workplace. So there's dominance between employers and employees. So when every employee in a company has dominant relationships with uh, everybody else, the result of this is a dominance hierarchy. So uh, let's say you uh, join a new company, and typically, you find yourself at the bottom of the hierarchy. And so the question is, uh, if you're ambitious and you want to climb uh, uh, on the top, how do you do that? So in my book, I describe at least uh, uh, three different strategies that can be used by new employees to climb the power ladder in their company. The first one is illustrated by a character that I call the good citizen. Okay? This is somebody who uh, uh, is a very friendly person and behaves very submissively and smiles all the time and will attend every business meetings, essentially say yes to any request for extra work that the boss might <laughs> make to this person. And this person is very careful never to uh, rock the boat, never to shake things up, never to complain about things. And essentially this person uh, waits and, uh, and hopes that uh, uh, he or she will rise in rank gradually over time, essentially through a seniority system hoping that uh, he, her, her or his uh, good behavior will eventually be rewarded by, by the people at the top. This is a good strategy, but if you're really ambitious to, to be at the top of the, being the CEO of your company, it might take a long time uh, using the strategy, and you might not actually make it at the end. So something else is needed. The second strategy is illustrated by this character that I, that I call the Young Turk. This is somebody who has no patience, is very ambitious, very self-confident, and essentially wants to get to the top immediately. So uh, not going to play the good citizen. Uh, he identifies who the people at the top are and essentially challenges these people right away in some way to try and essentially take their place. Uh, and finally, there's the third uh, uh, character, the third strategy, I call the Machiavellian strategist. This is somebody who, uh, when uh, he or she first joins a company, uh, initially uh, gathers information about the dynamics of power within the company, is initially very friendly and very nice to everyone, uh, but in the meantime, uh, once uh, uh, he or she figures out what the dynamic of power is, who the players are and who are not, who's going up and who's going down the ladder, this person will make key alliances with the key players, and then after a while, maybe a year or so later, after the alliances have been built and uh, with the support of these key allies, this person will challenge the person at the top and try and get uh, at the top of the hierarchy. Now, the interesting thing about this strategy is that there are almost identical parallels in the, in the monkey world. Uh, I study monkeys called uh, macaque monkeys. These are Asian uh, primates that live in social groups with multiple individuals. Uh, males leave the group in which they're born at puberty at about four to five years of age and join a new group. When they join a new group, essentially, they would like to climb the, uh, the hierarchy and become the alpha male, and they can do so in three, different in three different ways. The first one is the equivalent of the good citizen. We would call it the unobtrusive immigrant. So uh, uh, the male enters the hierarchy at the bottom, behaves submissively, friendly to everyone, and essentially slowly and gradually rises in rank through a seniority system without ever challenging uh, the monkeys at the top. The challenger immigrant instead uh, uh, picks the fight the first day. Uh, immediately challenges the alpha male in the group the first day he joins the group. And if he's successful, he will defeat this male uh, in a fight and become the alpha male on day one. The challenger resident is the equivalent of the Machiavellian strategies. This monkey will make alliances, will establish good social relationships, will create a base of support, and eventually will challenge uh, the alpha male maybe months or years later. So the question is, why? 
do these three different strategies exist? There are two evolutionary principles that explain why uh, there are similarities between humans and uh, other primates with regard to social behavior. One uh, is an evolutionary process called convergent evolution. So this is a process uh, uh, by which organisms that deal with similar social problems often come up independently with similar solutions to these problems. Okay? So we humans and other primates have to deal with many social problems uh, that arise from the fact that we live in highly complex and competitive social societies. The problems tend to be the same, the solutions tend to be the same as well. There's another process uh, called phylogenetic inheritance, uh, and that is the notion that the closely related species sometimes inherit the same behavioral traits from their common ancestors. So primate species that are very closely related to us, such as chimpanzees or other apes, uh, have similarities in behavior that derive from the fact that we share ancestors with these other primates about five to six millions of years ago. And so this is an illustration of uh, patterns of behavior such as the smile that are closely uh, similar and that are inherited from a common ancestor. So this is a rhesus monkey showing a fear grin, the equivalent of a smile, a chimpanzee, and a human being. There's a chapter called Cooperate in the Spotlight, Compete in the Dark. That, to me, is slightly counterintuitive. As a psychologist myself, I would have thought it was the other way around. Do you want to explain a little bit about that particular theory? Yes. Uh, I, I begin this chapter with an experiment done at the University of Newcastle here in the UK in the psychology department, where people uh, in this department uh, uh, make themselves coffee and tea every day, and they put uh, coins in a, in a box. And it turns out that uh, uh, a psychologist did an experiment where uh, for one week, there was an image of two eyes uh, on, on the cabinet uh, facing the, the person who was making coffee. And on the following week, the, the, there was an image of flowers. And so the images alternated. One week, there were eyes, and one week, there were flowers. It turns out when there were eyes on the floor, uh, on, the, uh, on the picture, people put a lot more money in the box. They paid more for their coffee and tea than if there were flowers. So why is that? Because the perception of being watched, even though you know that consciously nobody's watching, it was just an image, uh, makes people more cooperative, makes people more likely to be honest. So people unconsciously think that if somebody's watching, they need to behave. Uh, they establish a good reputation if they behave, and uh, if they get caught while somebody is watching, the cost, the price can be really high. So cooperating in the spotlight refers to the fact that many experiments have shown that uh, uh, if you have a game of cooperation and the identity of the players are known, uh, then people are more likely to cooperate. Whereas in a condition of anonymity, where identities are not known, people are less likely to cooperate and more likely to be competitive. And this is what I refer to when I say compete in the dark. Do you think all aspects of human behavior can be explained by our evolutionary background, things like aggression and violence? Biology is not destiny. There's nothing deterministic about evolution or, or biology. If these influences, if these predispositions exist, I think it's important to know about them. I think knowledge is always important, but that doesn't mean that we can't change behavior. So we decide what behavior is uh, appropriate, what behavior is acceptable. We have social rules, we have moral rules, we have laws. And so if these rules and laws happen to be against our biological propensities, that's perfectly fine to try and inhibit or suppress these propensities.